All right. We'll be starting panel number three. Learn your ABCRTs, education or indoctrination. I think most of us here today have at least one simple thing in common. Uh, we don't like to be bullshitted. We try our best not to tolerate revisionist versions of history. And we want to be given only what sounds the best about who, what, and why things are the way that they are. Enter the critical race theory debate. I think the argument really hits home because we, and I'm assuming uh, there are parents in the crowd and some people that uh, will be parents eventually, but we aren't necessarily the ones at the table being wrapped up in this debate that rages around about CRT. It's our kids. I have a couple kids, and I'll be damned if, you're, if, if I'm not as vigilant as I possibly can be to protecting my children. And obviously, your children, my, physical, my children's physical well-being is obviously a priority, but CRT, some say, is an invasion of their minds, which may be even more important because they're, they're given a responsibility to try and articulate complex ideas on their own. Is CRT just providing context to the history of the people of this country? Or is it really a Trojan horse by ideologues who intend to shape arguments and dialogue in a way that could harm them? For our next panel, please welcome back our moderator, Carrie Smith. And our speakers, he's a math PhD and founder of New Discourses, James Lindsay. And please welcome back Mr. 150K, Sean Fitzgerald. We have a social justice warrior science dude who has an MS in bio biomechanics, Justin Jangles Gibson. And last but not least, our good friend, Michael Gonzalez. So thank you guys for being here. Um, critical race theory has become one of the most contentious issues this past year, with many crediting it for the recent gubernatorial election results in Virginia. I'm going to start off with a hard question, one the media has told me that no one can answer. I would like for each of you to attempt to tell me what is critical race theory? In your own words, how would you describe it to a friend? Oh, for well, I mean, there's two answers with this, and I would hope that we would get past level zero of the conversation where people stop talking about the obscure, like, legal theory that's taught in high-end academic institutions. Like, that's not what we're generally going to be talking about today. What we're going to talk about is how some of the, like, ideas on how to educate future generations from critical race theorists have trickled their way into education. And like, I believe people have different terms for it. They'll call it like woke studies or whatever. But this idea, the idea that we'll have like white privilege, um, like uh, I forgot what the word is, mixed in with the curriculum, or uh, we'll teach kids about like the the they're like we'll have kids obsess about oppression versus oppressor dynamics and all that. Like in terms of like the legal theory, I just want to agree right off the bat that we all agree that the legal theory is not what we're going to be talking about and what is being taught in the K through 12 schools. Do we do we all agree with that that the legal theory of critical race theory is not what we're not what the debate is about? Yeah, it, and it's also a weird way to frame the debate. It's like, so we're going to talk about critical race theory, but we're not actually going to talk about critical race theory. We're going to talk about everything we associate with critical race theory without actually talking about critical race theory because we're not talking about critical race theory because that's not being taught in schools. But it is being taught in schools, but we're not talking about it. You see how it's so hard? We've not had a debate on critical race theory yet because we don't know what it is, or at least we don't know what people mean when they say it because critical race theory is a very esoteric academic theory that it's kind of boring, it's incredibly complicated, but at its basic idea, it holds that race is a social construct, one born of power, not based in biology. So it says that basically, 
You tell me if this is a Marxist idea or not. It holds true that all men are created equal. All racial groups are created equal. And therefore, if we see vast disparities in outcomes that we see from these racial groups, there must be some sort of policy that is keeping people from being the individuals that they could be. Race is something placed upon individuals that keeps them from realizing the American dream. And that's what critical race theory is. But we have to get bogged down into like all these things that people associate with it because it's been associated with basically any weird race stuff that you see in school is now critical race theory. So it's a hard topic to uh, talk about because we're never talking about the same thing. So it is very important to like define these uh, concepts that we're talking about. James, do you have any um, disagreement with his definition, his proposed definition? Um, sort of. I disagree that it's complicated. It's extraordinarily simple, as a matter of fact. It looks like Lake Superior, but it's about as deep as a mud puddle. It's, if you want a definition for critical race theory, I'll give it to you in two words. It's race Marxism. That's all it is. It is the division of society into a stratified situation where race is taken as the central construct for understanding inequality. That's a direct quote from Gloria Ladsden Billings and William Tate IV in their paper Toward a Critical Race Theory of Education from 1995. So it is a study of the stratification of society through a Marxian lens. I will prove that to you in just a second. So uh, that, that, that centers race in all understanding of inequality. So while you gave a good insider's definition, it's not complicated at all. It's pit whiteness as a form of bourgeois property and the people who have access to that against people who are ex said to be excluded from that as whiteness as property is Cheryl Harris 1993 uh, where she says in particular among its property rights that whiteness carries uh, that whiteness has the uh, fundamental right to exclude and so the, the, con the construction or the claim is that race was constructed by white people originally from Europe so that they could exercise privilege and power and maintain it for themselves over people of color. This is a social stratification theory. When it's said to be that these people are held in conflict with one another, now we have a social stratification theory combined with a conflict theory. And uh, when it's said to be done in order to figure out uh, fundamental inequalities or to understand inequality so that those can be redressed through redistribution of resources and access, which we call racial equity in this case, then you actually have a Marxian theory of race. That's what critical race theory is. But let's not belabor the point. Let's just read their definition from their own book, Critical Race Theory and Introduction, by Richard Delgado, one of the founders of Critical Race Theory, who, by the way, at the founding conference in Madison, Wisconsin in 1989, said that they were a bunch of Marxists meeting to discuss if they had anything to come in common to talk about regarding race and law. But they were Marxists. And he wrote, the, wrote this book with his partner, Gene Stefanczyk, in 2001. What is critical race theory on page two? The critical race theory movement is a collection of activists and scholars interested in studying and transforming the relationship among race, racism, and power. The movement considers many of the same issues that conventional civil rights and ethnic studies discourses takes up but places them in a broader perspective that includes economics, history, context, group and self-interest. There's your false consciousness part, by the way. Another, that's a neo-Marxist idea. And even feelings and the unconscious. That's why they read your mind. Unlike traditional civil rights, because it's not like traditional civil rights, unlike traditional civil rights, which embraces incrementalism and step-by-step -step progress, which if it rejects those, it must be revolutionary, which is what all Marxian theories are, critical race theory questions the very foundation of the liberal order, including equality theory, because it prefers equity, legal reasoning, because it sees the law as a construct to maintain whiteness and to exclude access to equal protection under the law for certain races, Enlightenment rationalism, because it sees that as a white way of knowing, as opposed to the kind of structurally determined ways of knowing of, from, from people of color that are determined by their position, called social position or positionality, against these social constructs of power relevant to race that were created by white people in order to maintain their power and privilege over other people, and also the neutral principles of constitutional law. Just to be clear about our subject today, the second paragraph, although critical race theory began as a movement in the law, it has rapidly spread beyond that discipline. Today, many in the field of education, today is 2001, many in the field of education consider themselves critical race theorists who use CRT's ideas to understand issues of school discipline and hierarchy, tracking controversies over curriculum and history and IQ and achievement testing. Political scientists ponder voting strategies coined by critical race theorists. Stacey Abrams is in this book, you just didn't know it. Um, let's see, where did I go off? Uh, Ethnic studies courses, this is an important point at the end of the paragraph. Ethnic studies courses often include a unit on critical race theory in American studies departments. 
uh, teach material on critical whiteness studies developed by critical race theory writers. And here's the key. Unlike some academic disciplines, critical race theory contains an activist dimension. It not only tries to understand our social situation, but to change it. In other words, it directly in the second paragraph of the book on page three paraphrases Karl Marx's dictum for a social theory. It's race Marxism. It's as deep as a mud puddle, as broad as Lake Superior, because all it does is use a bunch of rhetorical garbage to make people think it's complicated, so you'll pay attention to it. Speaking of rhetorical garbage, did you notice how he would read something out from the book and then define what it meant for you? That's one of the reasons that we're having such a hard time talking about this. Instead of listening to the critical race theorists, you're listening to the people who want to discredit critical race theory. This is better, so this is the Better Discourse Conference, wouldn't you rather hear these ideas explained in their best possible light with the best good faith effort to understand the strongest position and then critique that? Because there are definitely critiques okay, of Justin. critical race theory. There are definitely critiques of this uh, theory because there's critiques of any sort of theory. Where? But instead Where? of like, reducing it down to Where? race Marxism. Where? One of the reasons Name a critique of this theory in the academic literature because it's outside of like three law articles from 1998 well, because, and 9. Sure, here's a really good critique of it. One, if there is a lot of a discussion within it, so they have a hard time. If you wanted a big critique... They're of all it, internal like, no. critiques. They all take on the fundamental assumptions that race must be the fundamental so construct for understanding all inequality. So he's doing the thing where he's trying to tell you wh what I'm saying, as, and he, to do it, he's interrupting me. So and I you are talking to the it. audience and not to me. S yeah, and then you interrupted me to let them know what I was so, actually saying. Wait, Mike me, didn't so get to give his can definition. I, can, I, can, I, can I finish I that one point? Book. So one of the biggest critiques well, is because... Okay, it, because, yeah, he's going to actually speak at some point. Uh, so one of the biggest critiques of it is because it's about critiquing, it's about uh, deconstructing a lot of ideas, and that's not a bad thing. It's good to take a critical eye to certain positions. Like, that, like there are problems with colorblind laws. Like, there's a lot of uh, examples in history where there was a colorblind application of law that nonetheless had a very, very bad uh, disparate outcome between racial groups. Like, for example, like, uh, for a lot of, like, the, the Jim Crow laws, they treated the races equally because you had to stay on your side of the line no matter what race you were. And that's, like, that's not treating races differently, but obviously the effect of that was to deny black people the opportunities, the economic opportunities, the uh, housing opportunities that would actually get them a life that could be considered in any way an equal opportunity. That in what year did that become people. illegal? In what year did that become illegal? Well, a long time ago. However, we still have modern examples of that today. So, for example, like, there are a lot of uh, laws that are passed against like, multifamily dwellings uh, in certain residential districts. And that might be a, f a fine colorblind idea, but it, what it does, it uh, excludes predominantly people of color into moving, into like, basically just mobility, into letting them like, move out of uh, places where they might want to move out of and into other places. Wait, so, is, that a, is that a discrepancy that's based in their racial category? Is it a discrepancy that's based in economic status that correlates strongly with their uh, race? Because if it's an economic issue that correlates with race, it's an economic issue. But if we take, again, Gloria Ladsden Billings' explicit, it, again, I can quote the paper, critical race theory exists to make race the central construct for understanding inequality. It's a direct quote from Toward a Critical Race Theory of Education, 1995. Well, yes. Hold on, hold on. If that is what's going on, what we have is a case with the univariate fallacy being applied, where now everything that's a discrepancy, a disparate outcome, must be condensed down to being understood in terms of race. Now, you even said this in your definition. You even, when you gave your definition, so let me use your definition against Critical you race now. theory looks at race. Who would have thought? Of course it's going to play. No, 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 no. Because it's, it the, it's the variable race, we're looking at. No, it makes race the central construct for understanding inequality. That's a very different thing than to say it uses race. It uses race because that's what the variable that we're it looking at. It uses can, can race Michael, as talk. the determinant no, no, variable no, to this. all inequality, which is a bogus analysis. That's the kind of thing it's a, a child would do. Of course it's a bogus analysis. On what basis is that a bogus true? analysis? I didn't hear you, sir. On what basis is analyzing oh. inequality through the lens of race a bogus analysis? No, no, only when, through the lens of race. Th because if there's any other variable, you've ignored every single possible other yeah. explanation. That's what, why. What he's calling bogus is it's basically a reappropriation of the God of the gaps argument, except it's a racism of the gaps argument. That's Essentially, exactly right. you see a gap, you fill it with racism, much as in the atheist versus creationist debates. Uh, God was filled in whenever there was a gap, something that couldn't be explained, or even if it could be explained. Like, one of the things that was brought up is uh, children's discipline and the disparities in outcome between children in K-12 through education and their suspensions. And it's like, oh, look, black kids are disproportionately more suspended more in K-12 through education. 
It's like, yeah, they're overrepresented in all our violent crime, uh, crime statistics. Why would we expect that to only start when they leave yeah, school if, and none of those problems would manifest there? So, like, we've had programs in this country from the Obama administration based on the idea that disparate outcomes is sufficient to prove racism. That's what we're calling bogus there, but right correct, now. Correct. Because and there this is, is a very logical and easy explanation for that, and it's in the legacy of Jim Crow. There were race-explicit laws designed to create disparate outcomes. When did those go away? there were race-neutral solutions to those. That doesn't erase any of the legacies of those race-explicit uh, laws. When did those laws stop existing? So there's also a very narrow view of racism that we're talking about here. One is a deontological view of racism which says that racism is bad because it's bad. And that's good. I hope we all agree with that. Racism is bad, kind of intrinsically. But there's also a consequentialist view of racism. Racism isn't just bad because it's bad. It's bad because it causes... It's structurally outcomes. determined. It causes what did I say? people to have a lack of opportunity to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. That is in a very American concept. A lot of people think yeah, CRT but we're is anti-American. But Justin, it's, a, it's a fundamentally Justin. American idea. It is taking those American ideas seriously. Primarily that all men are created equal. That are jangling. Racial boundaries Justin. are being placed on people. Yeah, these these ideas are called racial are Marxism, jangling. by the way. That's what the construction Lindsay proposed, well, is that the idea that any of this Let me just read another freaking critical race theories to you, and I, this is your definition. In that long you filibuster, please, ask. you had a giant filibuster where you read I, I, Richard wait, Delgado's wait, wait, entire so book. We, we don't need another page. Richard Delgado book. I want to understand what it is <laughs> you disagree with about his definition, because he read Delgado's I definition. Don't, I don't disagree with that definition. He's framing it like it's a bad thing. He puts it under the guise of Marxism, and he makes Marxism sound pretty damn good if you actually listen to what he says. He's coming in with a framing, and that framing is dishonest. That's what I disagree with. I dis no, 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 the first question was a definition. He literally brought a definition. I literally like, read I their the definition. You can't, you can't be more genuine than that. Well, what? I had the definition out in front of me, too, and you added a lot to it. That's my critique of what your definition was. Okay, let every me, other thing he said, you would look, interpret what I, I will meant. concede that writing things down, either on paper or on your phone, is for nerds. That is true. I but, didn't use my de No, I used their book. I actually have their book on my phone. Yeah. But I've I, read it like eight times. Reading is also for nerds. But nerds. I will I will also say uh, you brought up that Jim Crow is the is the reason, like the legacy of Jim Crow is the reason for disparate outcomes between racial groups, which is a little bit odd because we have certain indicators like the homicide rate in the 1950s going into the 1960s when Jim Crow was in effect being lower than the homicide rate post the Civil Rights Act. If Jim Crow were the cause of all these negative outcomes, then how come the negative outcomes appear to have no correlation with Jim Crow? So do you think racial attitudes ended? They were, they were fixed. They were fixed with Jim Crow. You keep I, asking like when these things were I didn't, were I didn't say they were fixed, but if you're going to say Jim Crow laws caused a disparity and that produced the all these negative outcomes. Of a culture Example which was specifically these violent crime. Well, the, the, then we these would laws... expect Jim Crow, if it caused a disparity in violent crime, to cause that disparity before it's repealed rather than after it's repealed. These laws are a byproduct of a culture which produces this idea. People can self-racialize. People can have a conception of race that might be negative, even reinforced by society onto their own race. It's no mystery that people who are treated badly, who have an entire legacy, a generation, a history of negative treatment by people in this country, would persist in carrying on those negative attributes even when the barriers of the law are removed. So this is what I call the racism of the gaps argument. So he said this was causing this. I disputed that because obviously Jim Crow laws, if they were causing something, You're would cause it when they're I in said. effect. You're not and then he's like, listen, so out in this. the abstract, there's some racism that is causing Sean, this disparity. Sean, you're not disputing so, what I said, so let's try this. So this is you, where we... Okay, here, I'm going to jump in here as moderator. Thank you. I have, I have a question about... this. Is, I, I think this gets boiled down to a lot of the time. Do you believe that, it, that we should judge and treat people differently on the basis of race? if it's for a noble cause, if it is to, in the service of ending racism, should we judge and treat people differently on the basis of race? I think it's a terrible idea. That's Ibram Kendi's idea. He says on page 19 of how to be an anti-racist nerd, uh, he says on the page 19, he says that the only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. Hey, James, you have a degree in math. Isn't that mathematically correct? If two groups have been, ha have these giant disparate no. outcomes. Wait, no, because hold people, on, no, 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 no. I have a question. No, I have because a question the, the person behind question. can see that they're behind and run fast. James Lindsay Phillips. If you've ever been on tra the, uh, an attract team, discourse. you don't want to be the person in the front because so you don't know what's so going on behind you. You want to be behind so you can faster. catch up. If the person behind has to run faster, isn't that unfair? They have to work harder to achieve the same outcomes. So if, you do believe we should treat people differently in the service of 
ending racism, we should judge and treat people differently. No, those. Wait, well, hold on. You're not going to absolutely explain that. In your individual life, absolutely you, no, he, he not. Advocated However, the, he advocated discrimination. Are you, just are you having trouble? trouble? So, if we have these giants, again, it's not just the deontological, the racism is bad because it's bad. It's because of the effects that it produced. So, if you're saying, like, if you want to close this gap, if you believe that all men are created equal and that we should have relative parity among racial groups because they are equal, that, is, that seems like a very American concept to me, then how are you going to use a raced blind thing to get there? It doesn't mean that we have to treat, we have to know oh, all the black people. No, we have to like rise you up, all the white people. We have to keep you down until everybody's even. But we can enact policies that disproportionately help black people while helping white people as well. Right, if, we're if you don't invest any sort of effort into bringing this gap together, it will never close on So how own. do you feel for example, about the uh, Ted Cruz amendment that he proposed when they were doing the Stop AAPI Hate Bill. So they were doing Stop AAPI Hate. This was in the wake of that shooting that didn't turn out to be racially motivated. It was a sex uh, worker crime. And they do Stop AAPI Hate. Ted Cruz proposes an amendment that says, let's amend the bill to outlaw the currently happening, the currently existing, the currently being employed racial discrimination in our colleges and universities against Asian Americans. And it was a party line vote. Every single Democrat who voted, which was all but either one or two of them, I would have to check exactly what it was, voted against removing an actual form of institutional racism against Asian Americans. Where do you stand on that? Not in favor of it. Not in favor of the, uh, uh, the law that would like uh, be disproportionately uh, impactful against Asian Americans. And how do you feel about no, vaccine now, passports? Is that, is that the only law? Are there, are, is that the only Wait, I have, a, I, have a, I have another question, because you were talking about how, like, everybody's equal, and therefore we should expect some kind of equal outcome, and the only way to cure past racism is by future discrimination. I know you wouldn't call that future racism, so, like, not trying to throw that at you. But well, it sounds strong in that position. Why but, don't you define that a little but, more like, honestly? What do you think he like, means by that? I know that Americans are obsessed with race and like our own personal racial history, but there is no evidence at all that being a discriminated against minority produces negative outcomes. In fact, the world is full of discriminated against minorities, Jewish people, Chinese people in Malaysia, there's different minorities like the Lebanese that have all faced similar forms of discrimination and have become successful, more successful than their majority country. So you have to like fundamentally prove to me that discrimination caused the gap in the first place before you can even get to the stage where you're proposing alternate discrimination to fix it. Because this in Malaysia, is what we're talking about. You're, when you lump any of these groups together, like, no, black people do not have the same history. They do not have the same like uh, lineage in the United States as most Asian groups do. They are different. All discrimination is bad, but again, you have to take a consequentialist framework of it. So there's something called the Y tree. So if we do see all this big disparity between black and white people, and usually when we talk about race, it's, it's black and white people, why do you think that is? It's called the Y tree. Like, why? Well, Eventually, well, you get to a policy or a history of policies, or you you really don't want to let go of this notion that maybe one group actually is inferior to another. Well, what, what you call a big disparity, I call a small disparity, because the disparity between yeah. people of their, in their origin countries of Europe and people back in their origin countries of Africa is much greater. Their so, origin countries so, so they're, do, so they're doing you're gonna way better. You're going to sit here better. and say that. Talking, you, wait, didn't you just treat people I'm, based on their I'm, race? I'm, I'm talking about their origin I'm, country No, no, I'm talking, about their, I'm talking about their origin countries. Like How many black people in like Appalachia, White man? people in America just come from Europe. Do you we guys know that? We need some reparations for Appalachia. Did, did, did you guys that? Is that race? That's what I'm talking I'm about. Like, so here, we have a narrower disparity. You just, I think But I'm saying we have a narrower disparity in the United States. No, but I think you just accuse someone of not wanting to like go of the idea that their race is superior. And I just have a question for you, because Texas is one of the states that has proposed legislation. We passed legislation banning, it's been called an anti-critical race theory bill that's, that's passed. And Woo. in this legislation, it says that you're not allowed to teach that one race is superior over Incredible. another. That's a, great, that's a great law to have. And so if you see these giant racial disparities, the reason those racial disparities are bad is because no group is inferior or superior to another. That's the entire impetus behind why critical race theory analyzes these things. No, 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 because it uses a fallacy in, in, in education. No, 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 it housing, attaches a fallacy to that. income, in wealth. If we see these, you're it still must be because filibustering, something has gone so I can't tell you because the, your people are flawed not definition. Inferior. Let me read to you from Dr. Kendi. Racial in inequity is evidence, okay, sorry, I'll back up. To fix the original sin of racism, Americans should pass an anti-racist amendment to the Constitution that enshrines two guiding anti-racist principles. This was your definition from the beginning, by the way. 
Racial inequity is evidence of racist policy and the different racial groups are equals, or at least you mentioned the different racial groups are equals part. You said it grows out of all men are created equal. But the second assumption here is all, all groups are equal and then racial, any, any disparity in outcomes must be interpreted as racism, which is exactly either the univariate fallacy any, that I was like bringing up or any, the racism of the gaps. Do you think that any, literally any uh, uh, racial disparity would be considered that? Or maybe do we that's have a That's what he history? said. That is, the, that is the view from critical race theory. Yeah, yeah, so, no, well, so one, he's not a critical thing. race theorist. Is he a critical race theorist? Here's the thing. Is you he a critical cannot race explain the Appalachian achievement gap using this, this, this framework. It's actually a great framework. I don't know why you pointed to him like it was a good point. Policy. The, no, the thing is, is how no, do you no, no, no. When, he, when he says the Appalachian achievement gap, he's talking about how mountain mountainous mountain people, people achieve... tended to lie behind people in the plains. Like That's this correct. is true. Yes, and, and you because know why? they have. No, certain... Do you know why? I'm yes. from Appalachia. Bad Geographical policies. disadvantages. No, because... bad policies. Yeah. No, yeah. no, bad no. What are you talking about? Well, wait, what are you if, talking if about? If you had, if you, if you had better access to the ocean than somebody on the mountains, then you were more likely to have trade. Trade creates economic prosperity. This is why typically areas where there's plains. I thought they you were talking about establish education. farms. That's what he's talking about with the Appalachian theory. The Appalachian. Okay, I thought it was he's about talking about like, geographical see, I thought things. It was, I thought it was why Appalachians do bad in, in school, and I could point to, the, to bad I'm policies. I'm talking actually so, mostly so about I cultural values. I don't values. want this to devolve into where we're just yelling over each other, and people at home and watching online can't tell what we're saying. So I, I do have. Uh, there's a couple of things in the me, the me, ideas that the media has been putting forward. One of which is that critical race theory doesn't exist. I think we're all in agreement that it does even though we might have different definitions for it. The other thing they've been putting forward is that, well, if it does exist, it's not being taught K through 12. Do we disagree on that? Sean Dis said it beautifully. There's the, the thing that's actually critical race theory, and then there's the deconstructed term that means literally anything that you want it to mean that's actually being taught in schools, as they say. So if you don't believe it's being taught in K through 12, what is it that you would oppose in the bills that... What, why would you oppose a bill that says, let's stop teaching critical race theory when you don't believe it's being taught anyway? Because, as you said, with the, with the Texas bill, it doesn't actually ban critical race theory, does it? It bans certain concepts that make talking about race It harder. bans critical so, race praxis, and praxis is an integral component of any Marxian theory. Any critical theory, by the way, critical race theory, any critical theory must have at least three components. This is according to Stanford Encyclopedia of, Encyc uh, Standard, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Entry on Critical Theory. The three components it must contain are that it must contain an idealized vision for society. It must be able to critique the existing society for not living up to or moving toward that idealized vision for society. And it must also inspire social activism and be able to be put into practice. So a critical theory What's requires praxis. So critical race theory requires critical praxis. If you read Paulo Freire, everything about the theory is praxis. If you read so, any of these folks, it's seriously, it's always praxis, praxis, praxis. It has to be put into praxis or it's not a legitimate critical race theory. So what's being done in schools is the praxis of critical theory, which is taking this stratif stratification view of society and is teaching children by separating them into oppressor and oppressed groups, privileged versus oppressed, teaching them about racial privilege, attaching it to racial so, identity, telling people so, through culturally responsive teaching that different cultures have different, or different races have different cultures, which is a fundamentally racist idea. I literally just that? met a black man the other day who sat here and talked to me about freaking anime Are you, for like an hour. Uh, just out of curiosity, are you? Here's a total weed. So, ju just uh, just out of curiosity, are you uh, quite intentionally redefining what critical race theory means in the public mind, expanding it as a catch-all for the new racial orthodoxy? Is that is that what you're doing? Just out of curiosity? I actually did not understand what you said because of the echo. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Are you quite intentionally redefining what critical race theory means in the public mind, expanding it as a catch-all for the new racial orthodoxy, so that no, we can you're actually talk me with about Chris what Rufo. it says? And now that and now instead of ironically. Now, I'm not Chris Rufo, viewing, I'm a stealth bomber. Ironically, instead of viewing each individual case as an individual case, yeah, there are definitely teachers out there who put out really bad assignments. And now, ironically, instead of treating those as individual cases of bad conduct, now we can blame it on this catch-all theory that says the exact opposite of what he says it is. I know what I'm saying, I so you can be clear, what critical race theory is, in its simplest brass tacks that's being taught in schools, is dividing people by racial category into privileged class versus oppressed class in maybe a complicated way, but nevertheless. So talking about racial privilege as a key component to understanding how race creates inequality, and secondly, teaching about the need for racial equity as a redistribution scheme that eventually leads to racial justice through some process that? of applying it long enough. Actually, all that's pretty good. It's not wrong. good. Hold it's on. communism. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, all that was pretty based. See, yeah. no, now, what, now, what, he, what he never does, 
What he never does is say what's wrong with any of that. It wait, didn't work last wait. time. It won't work well, this time. So okay. You agree but that that's being taught, but you agree that it should be taught. You think it should be taught that people should be divided up into oppressor and oppressed within the, in the classroom. No, because that's not critical race theory. It, it was what I was talking about. If there are individual instances of like bad uh, classroom activities, yeah, critique those. But you keep saying that critical race theory says that it's things that it specifically doesn't. So, for example, Iron who, here thinks, woke projection. who here thinks that critical race theory says that white people are inherently evil? Awesome. The correct statement is that critical race theory scapegoats whiteness as a form of bourgeois property. What does it mean by whiteness? What does it mean by whiteness, James? Do you the want me to fucking read it to you? <laughs> whiteness well, is a set part, of... Yes, I would assume you could just give me but a But while he's digging that up, I just want to point out that we had every critical book. race theory discussion ever, and I tried to avoid it by saying, let's not argue about the obscure legal theory and talk right, about it in this? practice. <laughs> we, right, went went through, we went through, it's not critical race theory, it's not being taught in schools, and also it's based, I'm kind of in favor of it, which whiteness. is how every single one of these conversations happens. Whiteness is a location of structural advantage of racial privilege. Second is it a standpoint, a place from which white people look at ourselves and others and at society. Third, whiteness refers to a set of cultural practices that are usually unmarked and unnamed. That's on Brandeis Universities. I could talk about whiteness as property, okay, which we already talked about. But to do this, we have to understand the definition of race. Are you going to answer what's wrong with that? Like, it, I'm it, is no, it is a Marxist let me, let me understanding. understanding. He did it. We're you just called spending, a Marxist. Yeah, okay, we're okay, two, okay, hold on. Here Definition of race from the same website. From Hello. Wait, wait, this, we're talking over each other. Let a misleading and deceptive. Yeah. Race. A misleading and deceptively appealing classification of human beings created by white people originally from Europe, which assigns human worth and social status using the white racial identity as the archetype of humanity for the purpose of creating and maintaining privilege, power, and systems of oppression, exactly like I said earlier when I was speaking off the cuff. It holds up whiteness as a special status, what we would have said bourgeoisie if we were vulgar Marxists. It gives this access to a greater standing in society to people that are designated as white, whether they are, say, Anglo, or whether they are, say, Polish, or whether they are, say, because Irish, or German, statuses already exist or now already, Asian. Because there are disparities in outcome and achievement between the different racial groups Because that it makes the fundamental fallacy of making race the central construct for understanding inequality. In other words, it commits the univariate fallacy of condensing you. everything oh, down to race and question. putting it in a conflict theory sense. So can I ask you a question? Are white people and black people biologically real? Are they biologically what? As in, like, can you have a biological classification of white and a biological classification of black that would hold up to any sort of scrutiny? I mean, that's no, biologist? that's not exactly right. Hold what on, you can hold actually on. No, that, do is yes you, or can, no. you can, you can, you can have. There are there are biological classifications of population groups spread throughout the planet. Some of them have different colors of skin. That that actually you can't. That, is, that's are not these deniable. Are these genetic clusters called race? Race is a low-resolution, socially constructed category Thank into which you. It people, is socially constructed. I yes. don't disagree with By you. Who? What I disagree with so, is Kimberly Crenshaw, where she says this social category is imposed, therefore we can't deconstruct it and walk away from it, mapping the margins near the end. Where she says that we need to reevaluate social constructivism to turn it into a critical constructivism that recognizes the racial imposition so that it cannot be deconstructed. Therefore, we have to walk away from, and this is her own words, we have to walk away from people who happen to be black and, f and embrace instead people who are black, I am black, over I'm a person who happens to be black, her reasoning is specifically, I'm a person who happens to be black, strains for a certain universality, in effect, I am first a person, when instead she says that we should be actually embracing an identity first mode that says that no, race is, because it's imposed, has to become a social location for a uh, anchor of subjectivity. That's her exact wording on this. What I'm opposing, what, the thing is, I'm saying, yeah, the thing that we call race is actually socially constructed, it maps poorly onto actual biological di uh, uh, groups that you could find, you could, you could draw DNA and actually detect differences in. It maps poorly on. It's socially constructed. And my view as a liberal is we should deconstruct that. We should take that apart, whether that's, I don't really want to use postmodern means, but we could use liberal means. Hold on. But what critical race theory says is, Another no, filibuster. we cannot and will not deconstruct it because it is imposed from without, which is not how true in 50 it? years. So how would you deconstruct this socially imposed thing? Because one, where did it come from? White has not meant... Stop talking about it. Oh, no. Stop. If we have a problem, just stop Ignore talking about problem. it. Ignore the problem. Hope it goes great... away. It I... will. It how... I mean, it's been doing great for the past 400 years. But this gets back to my question Jingling. about, do you believe that the best way to fight racism is by 
teaching kids that we are divided along these racial groups and that some, based on your race, you have a different worth or teaching you them, have more value. Teaching them that there is a so societal construction of race. Critical race theory does not propose this sort of biological construction, nor does it propose racial essentialism. It rejects it explicitly. There's no, it actually with, synthesizes it into structural there's determinism. Wrong, there's, nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with teaching children of something they can observe. They understand that race exists. They have a conception of race, and they develop it from a young age. It's worth exploring that topic. No, the, the Worth exploring. That's that, that, that. We have a Mott and Bailey happening again. What actually it says is that the imposition of race. Black, what it man. says is that the imposition of race creates a structurally determinant system in which the social experience of the position of race is actually essentializable. It's not essential in the biology. It's essential in the cultural and social experience, and that gives a unique voice of color, which is why Dave Chappelle making a trans joke came from his, according to the uh, to the article, to his position of white privilege. That's why Larry Elder is the, take the note. Black his, face of white supremacy. I want you to He's take black, note of his he entire strategy He has to stay on the plantation. Here. I want you to take note of his entirety strategy here. We're trying to give the best possible version of it, and he's done it several times now. He'll say, no, let me tell you what it actually means. I don't want to hear the strongest Because my this. eyes are open, Jangles. <laughs> because your minds are open? Because I'm not a liar, Jangles. Oh, no. So, I mean, okay. I, wait, I, I, hold on. I, I, well, you kind of are. Do you think that uh, critical race theory essentializes people based on race? Yes critical no. race theory has a long you going answer yes or no. I'm going to answer yes or no. Yes or no. Does critical race theory essentialize people based on race? Yes, yeah. by no. proxy. So, this is exactly wrong. This is not a mischaracterization of critical race theory. He asked an illegitimate question this and thinks he got a gotcha. This, Fuck this is this not guy. a mischaracterization of critical race theory. This is the equivalent of getting every single question wrong on a multiple choice exam. The only way you can be that wrong is if you are intentionally being... This is why I didn't go so on his podcast. Race theory, in Delgado's book, which I also have, in Delgado's book, they said they reject race essentialism because it is, not the, it is a socially imposed thing. Therefore, someone cannot be essentially blind. It essentializes by, your social experience but by positionality. Taking, you know, so, I've explained it four we, times. But if we agree on this, this race is a social construction, it they does They say it gives a unique voice of color. You so if you're black, you have to speak. You are Ayanna Presley says, talking. Ayanna Presley said, we don't want black faces who won't be black voices. We don't want brown faces who won't be brown voices. Why? Because there's a unique voice of color associated with the structural experience. That's critical race theory. Do you not understand Saying the that black between... people think the same. Okay. Not that they are the same, that you, they think the same. Every single question on that multiple choice exam has been marked wrong on purpose. So, no, <laughs> you seem to like this deconstruction of race. You said correctly that. Can I talk? You doing okay? You used a lot of words, man. <laughs> a lot of unnecessary words. Cut to the chase. You're wasting <laughs> my time. Of irony coming from you, but okay. Yeah, right. some of us so, would like to get agree. involved in the debate. I uh, say, we agree that white and black are poorly mapped racial categories. Where do they come from? They came from power structures who want to, uh, specifically in the West, who wanted to justify the slave trade. The people who were like, yes, uh, Africans sold slaves, but they didn't think of themselves as the same racial group. That was something that imposed upon them. So white people had this power structure, and then they decided, they grouped the races of the world uh, into four different categories, whites, uh, it was yellow, red, and black, and they uh, marked them. They, they put them in this hierarchy with white at the top. Now, all that was genetically very incorrect. This is where these things come from. Now, if you're going to say, like, so, yeah, it happened a long time ago, so did the Declaration of Independence. We still see its effects today, right? So uh, these categories of white and black didn't come from nowhere. They didn't come from biology. They came from power structures that wanted to use they, those... We didn't they, reject they, the Declaration of Independence. We rejected race, yeah. bi biological racism decades ago. So, huh. so I have a question. What do you exactly oppose in the bills that, that are opposed to critical race theory in the classroom? Um, actually, let me hear from Michael. <laughs> uh, tell you the truth, I don't know much about them. If, if the construction you have for critical race theory, as any of these guys are explaining, is that it's, it's outlawing uh, this teaching that one race is superior to another, I don't have an issue with it. But so, I'm willing to bet there's probably a whole lot more baked into it and an impetus behind these I, sort of things that come from the likes of James Lindsay. Well, my, Michael, can I read this to you? Because sure. I think we might actually agree on some of this. And, Hallelujah. And this well, no, it gets into something practical. Like, <laughs> here's a bill that has been proposed and passed in Texas. So let's look at it. They added, first of all, 
they added uh, things that they want taught in all schools. It includes a list of additional historical documents written by people of color and women that House Democrats had added. It also mandates that students be taught, quote, the history of white supremacy, including but not limited to the institution of slavery, the eugenics movement, and the KKK, all that and the, ways, good. the ways in which it's morally wrong. So they've that, added, that's great. and I'm going to skip past like two pages of stuff Just they've added. Can we, take, can we teach more about Martin Luther King other than the one quote that everyone likes to quote? Well, that one quote's well, in here. Yeah, but well, is, is, the the scary Marxist quote? His is the scary Marxist stuff he said in there, too? Here, just let me get to what we... It's this is race the, this Marxism, is the, yes. This is the part of it Don't that fuck I'm, with I'm me. Did about. you just say Martin Luther King was race Marxist? No, 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 no. Critical race theory. Sorry, I can't hear you because of the echo. I'm serious. So, so they've added all these things, but here's what they're banning, okay? They're saying that a teacher may not be compelled to discuss a particular current event or widely debated and currently controversial issue of public policy or social affairs. Does that sound good? No. No. What she, she, no, it says she can't be compelled. Be compelled. Where, what better place to discuss controversial topics than in a classroom? No, no, you, you misheard. It said she cannot be compelled. You're, you're again, you it's want them to be compelled to discuss it? Oh, uh, okay. It says, um, yes, because I think it grows critical thinking skills. So, so you, you so you do want to enforce like your you do want to enforce like an ideology to be delivered no, by teachers to students. No, nobody said anything students. about enforcing We're an ideology. We're talking about compelling nice teachers. Way to straw man my words. No, I said I'm fine with compelling teachers to discuss comp uh, controversial topics with their students because I think it improves critical thinking skills for students to think about these topics. Think as advocates of free speech about race. Yeah, as advocates for free speech, wouldn't be all we be all for that? Because what are controversial topics? Who decides? What is a controversial topic? Because Who's right now, with our current definition that of weird? critical race theory, it means if you talk about race. Well, I believe I was tagged it does this, not uh, mean to talk day. about race. I, it means to put race as the central construct for understanding all inequality. So there was this thing sent to me, and can you at least like say this? There was this thing sent to me. Is that, uh, there was this survey given to fifth graders, and the survey asked. Do you feel comfortable talking about race in the classroom? Do you know anybody of a different racial group? It was just a survey, like a survey question that you would give to elementary schools. And everybody was attacking it, saying, see, look at the critical race theory. The critical race theory is in our schools. And it was literally just asking them about race. It's the straw man version that I would construct to take no. down, but it's actually happening. If you talk about race, thanks to the obfuscation of what critical race theory there actually is, to be this catch all thing, to be this catch all thing, to be this catch They're the worst kind of person who want to rip their skin off because they're privileged. No, no, no you're talking. Look at how far you have to go. Oh, People hold on. rip their skin hold off because they're privileged. That's the degree of separation you so, have to get from talking about the Jangles, actual issues. So, like any anybody can anybody can give a single example. It's like, oh, this innocuous survey. People freaked out about it because you know it's a hot topic in the nation, and there was this overreaction right here. But like I've covered this for years. So I did a story a long time ago on the Edina School District in Minnesota. And I was talking to you about it, uh, I think, yesterday. This was the number one school district in the state of Minnesota. And they were worried about the achievement gap because they wrongly assumed that all gaps are due to racism. They introduce a racial equity curriculum. What ended up happening was the Edina School District as a whole is no longer the number one school district, and the most negatively impacted students of that school district were the black students, the very same ones that they were trying to help. One of the reasons why the curriculum was so negative for them is because it emphasized like a lot of the things that we see in critical race theory, like specifically, I believe it was uh, Regina Austin, and I could be wrong on that, so somebody fact check me like a nerd out in the audience on your Google phones, where she was saying that um, that, that Ebonics, which they call African American Vernacular English, is a legitimate form of language, and we should teach black kids in that because trying to get them to conform to a standard American English is a form of black genocide. It's cultural genocide. The problem with that, I mean, you might say, okay, people talk on the street and they have differences from when they talk on the street versus work. That's perfectly normal. And it's like, sure, but school, they should teach you standard English because there's no textbooks written in Ebonics. There's no, in, in any subject at all. Curious, so what we actually are doing. a dominant culture, perhaps? So what we're actually doing is this, creating. This would you describe language, that as a dominant culture? Yeah, this construction of language is an example of a dominant culture, which is one of the things critical race theory goes over. There is no basis to say one form of a language is valid and another form is invalid other than whites have a dominant culture okay. in this so way. Thank you very in much. Practice, thank like, you very see, much, Michael. I'm I'm also from fucking Appalachia. We have a different dialect. Appalachia? We spell words from funny. Texas, we man. have not the dominant culture. No, the, and guess what? Well, there's an achievement gap. Shame, so why do you lean into why do you lean into something like culturally responsive and culturally sustaining teaching that maintain and exaggerate you, those you cultural need, differences? Those kinds of Look, the multicultural experiment was a failure. And if you speak in a language the students do not understand, 
Listen, we can make, will not resonate with the students. Listen, That's why. listen, we can make an abstract argument about how every dialect is just as valid as another dialect. But here's the thing. English is an international language of business. In India and everywhere else where they're teaching English, they're teaching standard American English. There is a wealth of scholarship throughout decades, centuries actually, written in English. This is why the Scottish, when they had their intellectual reformation, they needed to learn English because in order to grasp the knowledge, they needed to learn appropriately the languages where the knowledge was all captured and written down. If there were this length of scholarship in Ebonics, then this wouldn't be an issue. Do you see the fact how is there isn't, and this is one of the reasons why black literacy lags behind in this nation. So you're advocating for a policy in order to solve a gap that by its very nature will lead to greater gaps in the future and we saw that in Adina. So do we see how you can have two points here? Uh, so do you see how you can t have two points here? There is a dominant culture, and you have to assimilate into it in order to succeed. Nobody has to be evil for that. But it is a thing that it is worth talking about. So for example, do you agree that it's, it's really stupid to ban traditionally black hairstyles in school? You would agree with that, right? I don't care what people's hairs look like. Okay, so I'm so, wearing so, 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 you know, a shirt that says you, based, which was a black slang term. I'm okay with the dominant culture merging in a melting pot type situation. It does, it's not that the dominant culture doesn't move by virtue. Look how many things. I mean, freaking Taco Tuesday is a microaggression now because everybody loves tacos, which happen to not come from the dominant Mind freaking again, culinary tradition of, strong, of, of you know, England, which a, has one edible dish. You know, a really good uh, a really good exercise to do. That was a really dumb thing he just said. None of us would agree I with that. I don't say any dumb things. I don't listen to him. <laughs> All right, no, because he's, he's too based. All right? So, what, yeah, the way you had to stretch that to be an argument that would actually make sense. Like, oh, Taco 2 is a microaggression. No, oh, why don't dude. You ask? No. Now, hold on. Every time now, I'm, like, hanging out with my friends, we're like, vamanos. We say it in Spanish because, That's cool. because it's spread. Are we going to be yeah. offended by that? But I'm in the dominant you, culture. Why on, the, why on earth I'm dominating, right? Head. No, see, if Wait, we had a dominant have two culture. two people on here that you can no, no, actually no. talk to, or do you want to like, talk to imaginary people that make no, you listen. upset? If we, were, if, we were, if we had a dominant culture like you're implying with the word dominant culture, when somebody says, I feel like that's racist, we're not going to have a conversation. We're going to say, shut up, N-word. That's what it looked like 70 years ago. That's what a dominant culture that's excluding other cultures and not trying to meet people looks like. That is not reality anymore. That was reality a long time ago, and we the, the almost to a man there, in this country you, reject like it now. And it's not it because of critical be the race culture. theory. Do you, do you accept that, like, forget about set aside race for a second, even though these might, like, correlate with Why? one We're another? Why? We're having so much fun with this. Do you, no, no, I'm just saying, even though these might correlate with one another, do you accept that, like, different cultural attitudes and practices can lead to different outcomes? Where do they come from? I'm just saying, do you accept that that can happen? Absolutely. Where do they come from? Uh, all right. So my follow-up question is, if you accept that that can happen, uh, then why are you trying to preserve cultures, attitudes, and practices that lead to negative outcomes? If you want to do better, if you want the same out end game outcome, well, then maybe you, you should be, emulate more successful end? cultures. Like a lot of this reads to me, this critical race theory discussion reads to me like anti-Semitism. Well, we, we hear about the, the conspiracy of the whites that are self-consciously and and sometimes of overtly like conspiring against all of these minorities and they're working together either implicitly or explicitly. Sounds a lot like what a bunch of dorks say about Jewish people. The reason Jewish people are successful is because they have a long history of practices that lead to success. Instead of hating Jewish people, just like I say, instead of hating white people, instead of hating Asian people, if you want to be successful like them, maybe emulate some of those cultural features that allow them to be I have successful. Great I'm news throw for out you. That, I'm going to throw out And stop trying to preserve negative. On the question, because there's an obvious answer to your question, right? Would you you do not want bad cultural practices to persist through time? But you have to introspect on what makes some cultures bad, right? Why are these cultures producing bad outcomes? And not always is it because that culture is fundamentally bad on a fundamental level, but because of the society, the dominant culture, the way it might treat that other culture, right? And you should argue, you should agree that you shouldn't be changing one culture to placate the dominant culture. I mean, we're literally but seeing we, people take we, up critical race theory to say that time is a whiteness construct and that being on time and punctual is white now, is supremacy culture. Is that from culture. a critical race theory? Is that, or is that from something you found? Yes, in that, no, critical that is race. actually yeah, yeah, from, actually. that is literally from uh, Judith from Katz. Katz. So that is from like Judith thing? Katz, yeah. who wrote the book White Awareness in 1978. Uh, Michael, do you believe it's impossible to, to look at a culture and say objectively, like, that's a bad cultural practice. Like, um, I wouldn't say objectively, no, because you live, you exist within the, the a so context like of like a broader society. So, like throwing gay people off of rooftops is that culturally is that 
a good a culture that, is that encourages a good culture? that. No, that's a terrible culture, <laughs> right? But I only say that because I'm through this, I, the cultural context I exist in is one of a liberal order, right? If you change that in the fundamental level, you're going to change the people within it. Well, what about, the all, the, wait, 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 what about all the people in the countries where they do that? We live in a what about where the, the death penalty is practiced today. What about people right who now, grew up in a cultural context of communism and 0% of them about like an it? Objective moral well, wrong. Let's the talk dominant about culture that. is communism and every fucking one of them hates it. Why? Because the it's a catastrophe. The dominant culture is communism? In the Soviet Union it was, and you can't find a former Soviet who thinks communism is a good idea. There were Polish people here. Talk to them. See how they feel about communism. I, I, they I do want to ask you. I, 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 I want to address, agree with me that you, I want to address something that Mike brought up. Mike, I want to. I'm going to let Sean go, and then I'll let Michael. Yeah, I want to address something that Mike brought up. Mike said that uh, I shouldn't be advocating for uh, less successful cultures to assimilate and to please the dominant culture. That's not what I'm advocating for. A lot of the negative aspects of Black American culture date back to Scottish culture, which is where a lot of the Southern whites came from. The Scottish the whole point of the Reformation where they became literate, they started working hard and they got rid of some of their negative practices was to benefit the Scottish. Like what I'm saying is, is if your goal is to benefit the culture that's not doing well, then encouraging them, excusing them, placating them is not going to approve their situation. The Scottish got better and they were some of the leading intellectuals in the Enlightenment because they started to emulate successful aspects of English culture. I'm sorry, what we're dealing with in critical race theory is a racial conspiracy I don't theory. E I don't even disagree with anything Sean's saying. I, I think it's good things to emulate and to take things from other cultures that are good aspects of those cultures and abandon things that are bad from other cultures. I, I don't disagree with any of this at all. All I argued was that you need to deconstruct why some parts, some aspects of some cultures are bad. Do you believe that some things work and some things don't work? Incredible analysis. My car. No, I mean, what's the definition of good? I don't mean to be screwy with you. I mean, what's what the is the definition of, of better? Not even good, not good. What's the definition of better versus worse? It must have some goal orientation set against it. Something that achieves the goal more successfully is good. A hammer that breaks at the, at the handle when you swing it, not even a living thing. Not a very good hammer. A hammer that can drive in nails and not break. A good hammer. It behaves better. Why? Because it's better at achieving the goal. So if you... Do, and wouldn't it be better if the, we had The a pragmatic racial... argument means something here. Would it be a better society if all the racial groups were equal? They are equal. Equal under how? Board. They are. What are really? you talking can you, about? Well, can you define what you mean by equal? So, equity, I know that's a scary word. I know that's a really scary word. Equity is equality with an assumption. And equity is, is and adjusting is, shares so that citizens are made equal. I'm going to let Jangles talk about what he means by equality, and then I'd love to let you respond to it. So, equity is equality with an assumption. That assumption being the very Marxist idea that uh, all men are created equal. Again, so how do you measure whether or not we have equality of opportunity? So, why is equity not a measure that we could use to get there? If we had equality of opportunity, if everyone had the same shot of getting where they wanted to be, why would we see these giant disparities? Unless equity could be a measure to see whether or not we actually have equality of opportunity. Be, be, I don't think you would disagree with the notion that if you are born into a single parent household in the inner city that is surrounded by crime, surrounded with shitty schools, you're not going to have the same access to any of the things that you're going to use to live a good life. And so uh, you're not going to have the same access as someone who was born to like two kids uh, with a, like, in a nice safe uh, suburb. All right, I don't think we can say that those two people have ec uh, like the equality of opportunity. And one way we can measure that is to see what are their outcomes. Yeah, I don't. So first of all, equality of opportunity is kind of ridiculous. Like unless we're kidnapping all the kids at age three, throwing them in the same dormitory, we're not going to have equality of opportunity. It's like a nice thing people say. I'm not for equality of outcome. I'm for equality of opportunity. We should just be in favor of increasing the number of, oppor of opportunity because we're a merit-based society. And one of the things that you get when you achieve is the ability to set up your next generation for success. I'm, you I'm talked curious. about how just, you don't just, have the same advantage being born into a single-parent household. By the way, I was born into a single-parent household, so lived experience trumps everything. That makes me right. But, <laughs> yeah, that's because... That's because that's a consequence of the past generation's decisions. And those, like, like you have to accept and believe in cause and effect. Yes, every cause will eventually have an effect. So we should encourage better behavior, like having children after you're married would be a crazy radical example because that leads to greater success. And if and you have a wider... And how do we achieve that? If what you is have your a, solution here? If, it always comes down to, like, just... Hope individuals make better if you choices. Have, no, no, no. Are there no, no policies no. that we could look for to make sure it, those things are better? Well, and if that's true, aren't you advocating for Kendi's idea that bad policies are the reason that uh, we have these giant racial inequities? Is a good policy not to discriminate by race? 
No, yeah, I would generally because I would, you advocated I, for that earlier that we should discriminate by race when it benefits that, the like, people that you want to paternalize. I, I'm curious. To. Do you think that like uh, uh, passing policies that disproportionately help black people to uh, like? Do you think that's discriminating based on race in the way that you would define it? That you're trying that to that is it discriminating based on race. Period. So yes, if you are making no, no, so race conscious decisions, you are discriminating based on race. No, no, he's saying that have the effect without the intent. That have the effect without the intent. Like if yeah, just if coincidentally it, it ended Wait, up Wait, are doing you that. asking that if, we, if if someone discriminates on the basis of race, are they really discriminating they, on the basis of race? Or are you conflating <laughs> other that, variables with race mean? again, oh, like the like, definition of critical race theory? on the basis of race, in his head he wants you to think calling someone the N-word, calling uh, like using cracker with a hard R over here. That's what discrimination he wants you to think. But like helping, uh, like uh, in implementing policies that increase the uh, access to education, the quality of education that we get in predominantly black districts. I, black people ha live in uh, much higher rates of concentrated poverty than do white people. And so if we pass policies that disproportionately help people who live in concentrated areas of poverty, I think that's a good thing. We're helping some of like, the most vulnerable people in so society. So who are you and discriminating it would against? Be discriminating because it would disproportionately help black people, but is that not a good thing? No, to answer your question, by the way, the policy I would implement is stop subsidizing single mothers. Motherhood. It has been Correct. a disaster. Correct. If you subsidize something, then you get more of it. I, you know, sorry, mom. If but poor people had less money, it would be better. Yeah, pretty much. No, no, no. It's not about it's not about taking away money. Like that's 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 nonsensical. Under you're my trying, definition, you're, you want to subsidizing is taking less. Is no, no, no. You're trying to remove incentives for future people's behavior. Do, do like think, I like, get it. Do you think mothers have, like just want to have children and then so they're incentivized? Do, by I, the do I think the state of Georgia mothers? literally bans Nobody you from receiving welfare if you have a man Sean, in the house? Nobody because that is true. In life, to be a single mother. This is a silly straw man. This once is this is a silly straw man projection. He's talking about policies, though. Policies that incentive structures lead people to do. Things. What he said was that uh, the welfare state incentivizes single motherhood. It does. Yes. No. Hundred percent. It does. No. The welfare state is in response to single motherhood. No, no, no. Not incentivized. First of all, single. Then, it, then it's a terrible response because the Great Society has coincided with the greatest increase of single motherhood in American history. I mean, shit. If we sent all the men to war, which we did a couple of times, you don't know that we it wouldn't be have that many single great mothers. Society programs. Wait, you how, no how, does, to say how does the welfare society? No, no. You said it was a response. I didn't say it caused it. I just said it's a terrible response right. because it's coincided how, with a giant increase. How, let me ask Michael. How does the welfare feels? Welfare society. How does it encourage or offer incentives for people to leave single motherhood? Uh, I don't think it's designed to offer or encourage anybody incentives to do anything. It's designed to meet people's needs on the spot. Single mothers are people who don't have the financial support to take care of their child or themselves, and it's designed to meet them at that. Have it you is ever only been designed hungry? to keep, stop them from falling further into a trap where their situation worsens and they can't climb out. They have to climb out. You're, I'm Puerto Rican, and my Puerto Rican side is straight from the hood. Let me tell you. They Word. got men in the homes. They have the I men like the unmarried politics. for a reason to maximize benefits. If you don't believe people who are receiving benefits from the government do things specifically to maximize those benefits, then you, going to, because then you going literally to don't believe humans respond most, to incentives. Nobody aspires to be on benefits. That's You're talking about aspirations about, versus, no, versus behavior. Nobody talking, aspires to be this, this an but it's what do they do? Incentive. And it's just not. I think people make decisions based on their circumstances that they think rationally, Where do for these the most circumstances part, come from? I, that I think rationally benefit them the most. And if you create a society that incentivizes negative behaviors that keep you trapped in poverty, Again, we are not demonstrating then how you're this going to get these we are not people who stay in the this system. Incentivizes okay. negative behaviors. We are putting forward a thesis without evidence. In the okay, state of Georgia, let's, it's let's literally back, illegal to receive welfare if you have a husband in the house. Can I do the definition of equity first? Um, and, I, yeah, I would love it. for James to respond to Justin's I actually don't even want to respond. I just want to give a definition of yeah. equity. The definition of equity comes from H. George Fredrickson, who wrote the first paper on this in 1968 toward a, a theory of uh, social equity in public administration. And it was defined as such as where equality means that citizens A and B are equals, equity means, or social equity means adjusting shares so that citizens A and B are made equal. It is the redistribution. So don't none of this rhetoric about it's equality with an aspiration or some bullshit. No, it is adjusting shares so that citizens are made more equal on the back end based on disparate impact uh, uh, analyses, which may or may not account for the correct variables that led to the disparate impact because it's using a use race as the central construct for understanding inequality mono or sorry, univariate fallacy analysis, the racism of the gaps. Every disparate impact must be 
understood as caused by race and racism as opposed to possible other variables. That's it. What are those possible other variables? And We've just discussed culture for like an hour. Yeah, where does that's culture? one? And again, the why tree. Where does culture come from? Why? I don't know. Why do Chinese uh, people do have a different culture have than like Americans? Is that racial? Culture? If only there were some sort of means of investigating where these cultures come from. Perhaps it's yeah, like race. that people have different backgrounds. Perhaps like a the lens they, of analysis one might call. And critical? we should have kindergartners uh, doing it. I, I have a question. So no, who gets to no. decide? No. <laughs> yeah, firstly, moderator is just going to put that out of okay. there. Thanks, moderator. Okay. No. Nobody's advocating that you're going to teach no, little, what you're little, advocating little for Timmy that Michael. he needs to go and hate himself or anything like Michael. that. But there is a conception of race that children do have, and it's worth exploring. Mike, the, the, let, let, let me finish. Let me not finish. Bailey. Lindsay, you have spoken for like half this. Let me finish. I literally okay? have not. You literally I've interrupted have. You have everything. literally been reading books on stage. Let me finish. <laughs> I read two paragraphs. These problems do not arise out of a lack of, I'm sorry, these are problems do not arise because the left are too conscientious about the issue of race, and they're trying to teach children to be more conscientious about False. race. It, it arises because people like James Lindsay and the right are not conscientious enough about the issues of race. There are disparities that exist based on race due to past history of uh, legacy people of like racism you. that have not been solved. We're going we're gonna to go to Q&A, but I have one final question, because this this is how this conversation always ends up. I feel like we get to this fruitless place where we can't even agree on basic definitions. That's because we have to means. argue about whether yeah. we accept structural determinism or not. Right. That's it. That is the separation here. Critical race theory is based on the idea that race is structurally determinant. Liberalism is based on the idea that every individual is an individual, therefore your identity is not structurally determinant. And until you resolve that gap, which is unbridgeable, there is no conversation to be had because you're literally talking about the world seen through two different lenses. Lenses. How can we have a social construction of race, but not be structurally determined by your race? Because the construction like doesn't have to be determinant. It doesn't have to be that the construction itself creates conditions so that it controls how your mind works. As I just mentioned, the other night I met a nice black man that came to one of my talks. We spoke for a little while. He's literally wearing like anime t-shirt and like a kimono over it. And he's talking to me about every anime ever and bowing to me as he talks because he's adapted a bunch of things from Japanese culture. So his culture, what is he? What's his culture? Right? Was, is he stru yeah, he's a weeb. Is he structurally determined to have become a weeb? Hey, can we not. all at least, can this be the unified thing on the panel? He's an individual who likes... Right. All right, let the, let the questioners True. ask their questions. Okay. Actually, we're going to go to questions, but just quickly, I would love for you, each person, just to say something. Do you think there's anything that you share in common with the people who so passionately disagree with you about critical yes. race theory? About underlying, if you tear everything down to your foundational beliefs... Do you, do you at least have a shared why, if not a shared how? If, if I had to build a vision for the future, I actually agree with Lindsay. I actually agree, I, because I'm, I'm fundamentally liberal, I like the idea of moving beyond these social categories. But there has to be a time and a context for that where we first solved, resolved for all the disparities the creation of these categories has created. We have not yet done that. We have not yet achieved equality of opportunity. A poor black person does not have the same opportunities in life as a rich white person. But when you want to get to a place. But I want to get to a place where it stops mattering, where we've, we've solved for these inequalities, and it stops mattering because there's no sense in keeping them around, the categories around. OK. Does anybody else want to answer that, or should we do Q&A? I mean, he just gave us a great example of why we shouldn't use race as the deciding variable. He said rich white and poor black. A poor white person doesn't have the same opportunities as a rich black person. He added an... They why used to call them in critical race precursor. In the precursor literature to critical race theory, they called such rich black people the black bourgeoisie. There's a book called... They call rich black people rich black people? <laughs> they called rich black people the black bourgeoisie, so yes. And they are very much so against them. Yeah, it just means rich, basically. I mean, there's a little bit more. They call this a tautology in the business, James. There's a questioner up for us. I'm yeah. curious, like, why do you think that a lot of people called MLK Marxist? And do you think that they were wrong? Or do you think I, that maybe this is a strategy? That's I don't know what, what, if he was a Marxist. I know that he had socialist tendencies. But I know also that his legacy is the most liberal humanist statement tendencies? that has been uttered in this country since its founding. And let's learn about the other stuff, not just the one speech. We're going to go to the first question. Lindsay, you said that racial categories were created a long time ago and that nowadays people reject those old, outdated racial categories. 
How do you explain racial discrimination found in field experiments like Pager 2009, discrimination in a low-wage labor market, which found that white people were hired at roughly 1.3 times higher rates than black and Hispanic people with identical qualifications? Okay, so how do I explain was the question. Uh, the explanation probably is that people are making judgments based on stereotype accuracy, which is the most uh, most confirmed so, uh, finding in social science that we have. So a lot of people misunderstand what this is. I don't agree with this happening, but I do understand that that's probably the reason. What stereotype accuracy says is that if we look at a group and we list the stereotypes, that we will find large numbers of examples with high statistical correlation that that works out. But if we look at any individual, there's a very low probability that any given individual will actually meet those things. That disparity in statistics is not well understood. And so hiring managers rushing through things might, for example, be on the wrong side of this. Is that actually racism? Yeah, probably. On the other hand, and is it bad? Yes, probably. Can we judge that that is the cause, like that racism was the only cause? No, certainly not. And so that is a possible explanation that is obviously the one that, that critical race theory wants to latch onto and expand to its largest possible thing. But there's another one, which is we've talked about cultural difference quite a bit. It could be cult the, the probability of cultural fit. It could be the probability that, somebody's, they, that they suspect somebody's going to come in and be a liability in one way or another for the company. There are a lot of different reasons that hiring managers might make these decisions, um, but the stereotype accuracy reason is probably most legitimate. My, my, my response to you, however, and this is the key point for this conversation, my response to you is that critical race theory is probably at least the second worst, if not the worst way to try to fix this problem. To the degree that this problem exists, treating people as individuals rather than leaning into racial categories and leaning into stereotypes in order to make decisions in reverse discriminatory, I can fix you, don't worry, I'll help you ways is probably the worst way. Leaning into individualism is probably the best way to go about it. Leaning into stereotypes and leaning into critical race theory, which relies on these stereotypes and race conscious hiring, is probably the worst way to go about trying to solve these problems. Also, it was a tanning salon. Have you ever seen a black person work in a tanning salon? I haven't. <laughs> Next question. And you guys, I want to hopefully get through everyone this time. So if you could just direct, if you have someone specifically, direct your question to them. Question for the advocates seeking equity and social achievements. If two children raised in the same family aren't expected to reach the same achievements, like one child becoming a space engineer and the other ends in rehab, how can you possibly expect an equality of social achievements across whole demographics in a free nation in a random universe? Well, because, here's a really good uh, answer to that. When we say all men are created equal, obviously there's individual differences. People do have individual differences, and that's fine. What a critical race theory rejects, and this seems to be contentious, that there are no significant differences among racial groups. We have individual differences, but these fake categories of race that we uh, apply onto people, those don't really matter. Critical race theory treats people as individuals who have been unfairly harmed by systems that have placed race upon them. And so when we get to the why tree, it always comes down, you call it the racism of the gaps, but it always comes down to why, 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 why? Is it policy that is causing these like disparate outcomes? Is it the process of linear time, which absolutely everyone agreed, no one disagreed with this, uh, has put like certain racial groups above certain others, and maybe those have effects that have lasted you know, more than one or two generations past the passing of the Civil Rights Act. So that's all that says. Yeah, individuals are going to have different results, but they shouldn't have different results because of their race, either past or present. So it's funny to hear. All right, so I've got a, uh, I've got a quick question here. Um, there have been a, there's, hold on. There was a lot of conversation about how culture in of itself uh, kind of dictates a lot of disparate outcomes in society, and I want to particularly put this towards uh, James and AJW over here. Uh, what do you think uh, it causes uh, these uh, cultural di uh, disparities between uh, different people? I mean, there's, like, humans have not existed with this level of technology and integration 
for most of our existence. So adaptations to geography, like there's a, a million different things that can change practices that can be reinforced through the culture that it creates. Which is why, like, we don't, we, which is why when Columbus came to the Americas, the natives were more backward than the Spanish. It's like there's never been a time where any, everywhere in the world was equal, except for probably when we were hunter gatherers in the beginning. Like, so, like, yeah, your cultures are influenced by your environment, all different kinds of factors, and geography is a big one. And yeah, we, we shouldn't expect equal outcome. Like, that's a great fallacy. Yeah, uh, hey James, I wanted to ask you, um, so I know that we probably have some like semantic disagreements on what like critical race theory means, but I was just wondering, um, what would you say about a policy that like specifically addressed also poor white like Appalachian communities? I'm actually from East Tennessee myself, right? So it's building infrastructure for them, also providing federal grants to them for like better schooling, and it's based on income. Now we acknowledge that that would disproportionately help black people like nationwide due to the fact that they are statistically more poor, um, but would you be okay with that? Because it lifts everybody up out of poverty and then leads to less disparate outcomes due to the fact that uh, basically the poor communities are no longer being so negatively effective and it doesn't compound in on itself. Because you said that you think that it has to be a non-economic reason uh, for this due to the fact that under Jim Crow they were oppressed worse, but like economic inequality has actually gotten worse since Jim Crow. Uh, segregation as well, just due to the way that uh, housing uh, works as far as like being able to pay for it and also the redlining in the past. So I was just wondering, would that be a policy that you were open to? So I'm, I'm going to try to guess a little bit at this because I apologize, it's extraordinarily hard to hear up here for the questions. It's, it's shockingly hard to hear and that was a bit of a complicated question. So if I've understood correctly, uh, the first thing I want to say is that I actually think that being less race conscious, period, and being more, if you want to actually look at the conditions that cause disparate out outcomes, I would say the overwhelming one of these is, is economic. And so policies that are more or less race blind, but that apply by economic status. The funny thing here is, is if you care about equity, they are going to, as you mentioned, I think, I th I think you mentioned, will be disproportionately accessed by people who are in demographic groups who, for whatever set of reasons, are also more frequently uh, economically depressed. And so the racial equity comes along with that with a, with, through a, a race-blind policy, which seems to be a way that isn't going to exacerbate race consciousness and thus racial division. Um, so for that part of your question, I, you know, I would, I would, if that's what I understood correctly, yeah, I would... literally call that an anti-racist policy. By I, would, I would advocate for, for uh, race Blind, race blindness in such policy and to focus on the variables that are more relevant. Now, if we were talking about what other variables that are not economics, if, and I think you said something about that, but I, I swear I can't hear you. Um, and I apologize, but, or, but there are also cultural values. So we just talked about why cultural values arise. Some of those might even just be accidents of history. Something happened and he became, somebody became famous and people started copying them and just, you know, whatever, is this quirks or whatever. So there, there are different cultural values. When I look at Appalachia and I, uh, grew up pretty deeply in the Tennessee Hills, and I have a number of friends who are like proper old school Appalachians. I dated a woman in college for three years who, who lived, her, her family referred to where they lived as on the mountain. The entire family lives on the mountain. Nobody's allowed to leave the mountain, and she was actually heavily indoctrinated by her family while she was at university. The, the university's not for you. You're too stupid to go to college. You should stay here on the mountain. It's a betrayal of the family if you leave the mountain, if you leave the area. So this is, these are all white people, so this is not a racial comment. But those particular values, you shouldn't study. You should stay here. You shouldn't reach out. You shouldn't go to places where there's more economic opportunity. You shouldn't get a degree that's going to pull you away, like J.D. Vance talks about in Hillbilly Elegy, that's going to make you culturally distinct from the family, which is a betrayal. Those kinds of cultural protectionist attitudes, which are also prevalent in the inner city ghettos, and they are also prevalent in Latino ghettos, uh, those particular practices are actually part of the problem as to why we see these disparate impacts. And this is people choosing by their own, uh, in their own volition to not integrate with a dominant culture. And my view from, the, as far as critical race theory goes, is that critical race theory by dominant culture, dominant culture, dominant culture, it's imposing on you, it's cultural colonialism, it's cultural genocide, that's words that they use, actually exacerbates those problems rather than loosening them so that, again, critical race theory becomes the least good answer to a problem 
where there are many other possible answers. But critical race theory says that all other answers are intrinsically racist because they don't do critical race theory, therefore they uphold the dominant culture and they don't critique it at its most fundamental levels. And so it's just a terrible approach. And I don't know if that was exactly your question, but I did the best I could given what I could hear. Hi. Having spent the last, well, over 30 years in a major metropolitan school district, I'm gonna tell you, first of all, kids judge each other by the content of their character long before the color of their skin until they're taught not to. And second of all, I would like to know from this side of the aisle, okay, what you think about policies that have been inflicted upon public education by the liberals, such as policies inflicted upon, the, upon education by liberals, such as Barack Obama's administration coming in and saying you could no longer disproportionately suspend students. So when you work in metropolitan areas where the majority of your students are students of color, the students that are being hurt by that are students of color. Also, it, because you guys, all of you do wonderful research uh, for the next time. I'd like to hear some research on how many opportunities are actually available. Maybe we should all be getting together and talking about what we could do to push education and how that's everybody's ticket out, rather than all of this. But to my question again, how, does, how do democratic policies, such as disproportionately uh, disciplining students of color as a, in inner city schools, how does that help black children achieve or, or children of color of any color achieve? Doesn't that disproportionately hurt the children who actually are behaving? Truthfully, I do not know the policy that you're talking about, so I do not have an informed opinion. Okay. But uh, from a critical race theory perspective. Go right. read Dear Colleague, the De Dear Colleague letter from Barack, uh, Barack Obama's administration, Eric Holder, Barack Obama. Just, Justin, she's referring to policies cracking down on schools that disproportionately suspend students uh, to their population because it doesn't match like the racial demographics. Right, restorative I think those justice. Are those are worth looking into. It's not okay. automatic evidence of racial discrimination. And I know but I'm it's taking. worth looking into. Like we. I, I, I never got to ask this. Is racial, are racial disparities significant ones on things that matter, like income, like uh, access to uh, neighborhoods without uh, like high crime rates? Is this a problem worth solving? Give them reasons to achieve rather than reasons not to achieve. Kids will surprise you. Stop, stop insulting people of color and saying that they can't achieve, because that's basically what you're doing. I look at people that I've worked with every day of my life, and they achieve of great proportion. What about they love their children. We just said gave Do you not, the idea. We were saying black people can't achieve. Notice again, this entire debate is us batting down silly straw men constructions of what critical race theory is. I don't think ne neither me nor Justin have argued that black people are fundamentally incapable so of achieving. Fun topic racial because essentialism. people will tell you what you believe and then argue against that. I couldn't hear any of that. So next question. <laughs> All right. Could you guys on the right please describe to me what the critical race theory education would look like that you would want taught in school? And could you guys on the left, based on what they say, describe the foreseeable ne negative ramifications of that? <laughs> yeah, we're a little confused. The, po oh, okay. the political left, stage left, or your, your left? Guys just just left. use political left and conservative. My right. on, on my right, could you guys describe what the critical race theory education would look like that you would want taught in school? And could you guys on my left describe the foreseeable neg negative ramifications of that, if there are any. Sure, I, I think teaching students the benefits of, of things like diversity are, are pretty good. I think teaching a more race conscientious history is also good. Um, for, for, for example, a lot of people have this misguided idea that racism as a poly functionally, policy functionally ended with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, something to that effect, right? What's not really taught and what's not really translated well is the legacies that these laws have over time. Um, there, are, there are racist laws that have been passed, right? And racism can manifest in more ways than just being explicitly. Just saying the N word is not the only way to be racist manifest, right? You can be racist in intent, you can be racist in effect. And we still battle problems with this today. Take, for example, there was the state of North Carolina passed a voter ID law where the, the state general assembly uh, gathered voting data by race to pass an ID law. And the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals struck that down because they targeted black people with surgical precision. But in the letter of the law, it is race neutral. So you can have something that is presented race neutrally, which still has racial outcomes. And if we had a better education on stuff like that, I think our students would be more conscientious at solving these problems in the future. That's a good thing. 
Yeah, so because uh, remember, critical race theory is not taught in schools for the same reason that string theory is not taught in like elementary schools. It's, it's a you know it's an academic, uh, esoteric theory taught up there. But there are cer certain concepts that I would like to uh, taught. So for example, uh, James was talking about like stereotype accuracy and things like that. So a lot of people have a false notion of racism that it is a continuation of previous policies. And while that certainly can be true, it can also work backwards from very very American good intentioned ideas. For example, if you believe in meritocracy, a good thing that everyone believes in, critical race theory critiques the notion that we have it, not critique, it doesn't critique the uh, notion of it on its own. If we, if everyone gets what they deserve, because we're in a merit uh, merit meritocratic society, and then you see all these uh, racial groups who are not doing as well as others, well, then you're going to think you're going to work backwards. Well, since everyone has the same shot at it, and since we solved racism with the Civil Rights Act in 1964, that must mean that some racial groups just aren't going to be as good at certain things as others. So racism can work backwards via that system justification theory. It can lead to, like, stereotype accuracy and people actually justifying why they're racist instead of working to correct it, which I think is a very amazing. American uh, way of looking at things. I mean, I would respond to what, what we just heard by saying what we're doing is elevating race consciousness and again, structural determinism by race. Um, the question isn't whether or not we should be working to try to uh, understand our history accurately or including the bad parts of it or to understand, for example, that there are cases where you can put forth a race neutral wording of the law that even in intention is known as they write the law that it's going to have, you know, they could write a voting law or an ID law or whatever, in, at least hypothetically, that they know is going to exclude black or Latino voters on purpose because they predict that statistically they'll vote a particular way. And that is a, even with, that's not even just impact, that's actually intent and it can be hidden. And the critical, the idea of a critical theory of race at its best if it were a liberal rather than a Marxian theory, would say that we should be critiquing that possibility and looking into it. For example, Kimberly Crenshaw, when she laid out intersectionality, pointed out that it is actually legally possible to get away with the discrimination against black women, in particular by showing that, look, enough white white men, or sorry, black men and white women both work here. So we have enough women, we aren't discriminating by sex because enough white women work here. We have enough black men, so we're not discriminating by race. But you could actually discriminate specifically against black women and have virtually none of them and still meet both race and sex. And a critical theory of, of the intersection of that that she puts forth would be able to pick that apart. What I'm saying is that there's a difference in methodology. There's a difference in the way that that analysis is going to be done. So what we've just heard is a presentation that we should use a critical theory that's based in Marxian theory, or critical Marxist theory, that's what neo-Marxism is called by Isaac Gotsman, for example, to do this, rather than to use the liberal method that begins by everybody as individuals, and we should treat individuals as equals to be evaluated on their talents and merits. Now, 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 Justin's a little bit wrong about its critique of meritocracy. It also is a conspiracy theory about meritocracy that the white people who are in power and have the dominant culture get to define what counts as merit and therefore exclude others by that. That's the perfect example of the kind of shit I don't want taught in schools because it's not actually true. Yep. The white people are not conspiring well, a under a racial contract true. to keep other races out since whatever time, you know, they are correct. Everybody knows. It wasn't 1964, Civil Rights Act passed, racism was over. No, everybody knows that. But what happened was that legal, the, the legal apparatus changed so that racism could be made illegal, and then the cultural fight could start to happen. And, dude, that is fucking rude. I'm sorry, you take such a long time, and we have okay, very done. little opportunity Look, to respond to what you say. Okay, you answer wait, 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 for me. so much right. bullshit that we try to respond to. Listen, listen, the listen, listen. listen. They're the ones who came here to get their questions answered. Let's yeah. try to get through as many critical race theory in the schools is to generate a racial red guard just like we had under Mao in China. The goal is literally to create a cultural revolution. Wait, critical race theory into the public Look, conversation. Justin will answer for me henceforth. We're going to let him answer. No, I covered it. And to, to follow up, we'll see what happens the next election this becomes an issue because if denying it doesn't work again, then they're going to shift strategy. So, like, one election in Virginia is not enough for them to change their strategy on how to deal with the criticism. But if education becomes a winning issue, they're going to change because that's how politics works. I'd like to thank you guys for sitting here with us during this panel, and I, I hope that you give a warm uh, a round of applause for James, Sean, Justin, and Michael.
I hope we can have more fruitful conversations maybe when there's not an audience. Round of applause for Carrie.